Hey everyone, this is Ryan here and welcome back to another video. In this video we're going to talk about instrumentation for extractions. Now you won't be tested on every single instrument on the board exam, but I felt that a video on extraction instrumentation has to at least include all of the most commonly used instruments. So let's go through one by one, talk about the characteristics of each instrument and how they're used. So first is the bite block. This is a soft rubber block that the patient can bite down on, and it's used to keep the patient's mouth open, which provides better visualization. Now, anything in dentistry, we want great access and good visualization. So this is important, but you might be asking, well, why don't we just ask the patient to keep their mouth open? Well, that's easier said than done because First of all, extractions can last a while, but more importantly, we'll be pushing a lot on the patient's jaw. So if we're working on a lower tooth, that's a lot of pushing on their mandible. And so that's asking a lot of them to stay wide open and can be uncomfortable. So instead we can use a bite block that they can rest their teeth on. And so it helps stabilize the mandible, which provides comfort for the patient. Not all providers will use this, but it can be a nice adjunct. The flat side will go towards the cheek, and the narrower part goes farther back, and the wider part is closer to the front of the mouth. So you can position the bite block while they're open, and you can push it more posteriorly if you need wider opening. Of course, they come in all sorts of colors and all sorts of sizes. Next are the suction tips. There are two main types here. The Yonkauer suction is mostly for soft tissue. It's useful when working on soft tissue at the beginning of an extraction because the tip is softer and it can su suck up a bit more fluid because it has these vents that go around the side of the tip. So it's more gentle when working with soft tissue. The Fraser suction on the right is great for both hard and soft tissue. There's a small hole that you can't see on the top surface of the handle, and it can be covered with your index finger to control the strength of the suction. So you would cover the hole when you're working on hard tissue for rapid removal of fluid, and leave the hole uncovered to make the suction a little bit more weaker to prevent injury if you're working around soft tissue. It also has a stylet, it's a thin, a flexible rod that you can pass through this metal part here for cleaning the suction, say if something gets lodged in. That often happens just because of how thin the suction is, and it's another pro to the Yonkauer suction, which is a little bit uh, thicker. Next we have the towel clip. If you place towel drapes around the patient's head for sterility, you can use these towel clips to hold the drapes placed around the patient. It has a locking handle with finger and thumb rings, and you have to be careful not to pinch the patient's skin. You can even use the rings to stabilize suction tubes, but again, just be careful not to pinch the patient's skin if you in fact use these. Next we have tissue retractors. So there are a couple ones I want to talk about here. On the top left we have the Austin tissue retractor, and uh, it's a right angle, and it's used mostly and best for small flaps. Now there are different ways of holding each of these instruments. You can either hold them loosely in the cheek, or you can hold them firmly placed on bone in order to safely retract a soft tissue flap. Over here we have the Minnesota tissue retractor. This is probably the most commonly used in practice today. It's an offset curved and broad shape, and it's mostly used for a cheek retraction as well as flap retraction. Again, the difference between these two retractions is one, you're holding it uh, more loosely in the patient's mouth, the other, you have to be firm on bone with the point of the instrument so that you don't slip and cause any injury. The Weeder or Sweetheart tissue retractor has this broad heart-shaped uh, end to it to protect and retract the tongue, hence why it's called the sweetheart. 
and it's great for mandibular lingual surgery, as well as the Selden retractor. It's long and flat, a bit different from the other ones here, but it's good for elevating down to the floor of the mouth. And that's, again, useful for mandibular tori removal. So both the Selden and Sweetheart are good for lingual tori or mandibular tori removal surgeries. Now, in addition to the soft tissue retractors, operators may also use a mouth mirror. But you definitely don't want to use your finger for retraction. Sometimes you can get away with that for operative and other procedures, but not for surgery. Definitely do not use your finger. And the reason why these tissue retractors are better than a mirror, and certainly a finger, is because you can retract an intraoral flap and the cheek and tongue simultaneously. Next is the periosteal elevator. This is a workhorse and one of the most important instruments in extractions. The Woodson periosteal elevator is on the left here. It's a small and delicate instrument. It has this uh, sharp pointed end, you can see zoomed in here, to lift a flap and it has a broad rounded end to elevate and reflect, and reflect that flap. The number nine Molt periosteal elevator is a larger version of the Woodson. It also has a sharp end to reflect papilla and lift flaps, and the broad end is to elevate a clean separation of the periosteum from the bone. So this is essentially involved in the first step of the extraction sequence, which we'll talk about in the next video. We want to sever the periodontal ligament fibers and the soft tissue fibers. These numbers I do have listed here, they can rarely come up on the board exam. So if you have any extra room in your memorization space, I would encourage you to remember these numbers. So next we have the dental elevators. So these are different from the periosteal elevators and they're, they're involved in the second phase of the extraction sequence. So elevators have a blade, a shank, and a handle. They're gripped with a palm grip. So you place the, the handle in your palm and then the pointer finger can rest near the blade of the instrument for the best optimal control. Elevators are used to continue to disrupt the PDL fibers, to luxate teeth, and expand the alveolar bone. And we'll talk about all of these mechanics in the next video. So the straight elevator uh, most commonly is the most commonly used elevator, and it can be uh, the number 301. And it's both Technically, it's both used as a lever and a wedge, but if I had to pick one on the board exam, I would pick um, a lever. So it's used mechanically as a lever in order to luxate the teeth. The blade has a concave surface, toward, and it's to be placed towards the tooth to be elevated. Down here we have the triangular elevator, and this is talking about the shape of the blade. Here we were straight, and now the blade is a triangle. This is uh, a crier elevator, and that is an important name to know for the board exam. It's the second most commonly used elevator here, and this one is used as a wheel and axle. So it's turned about its axle so that the triangular shape of the elevator can engage in the tooth. It has left and right pairs, and it's particularly useful for removing a broken root left in a socket. So it's especially useful for a single broken root of a mandibular molar. Say we were trying to take it out with forceps and we broke off one of the root tips. This is excellent in order to engage that broken root tip left behind. So definitely know that for the board exam. The third elevator here is the pick elevator and it's used to remove uh, retained or broken roots. So some overlap in function with the triangular elevator. But this one's great for uh, isolated retained root tips. So this one functions uh, purely as a wedge. So the crane pick, you would um, use 
usually insert between a retained root tip and the buccal plate and wedge it in between those two things into the periodontal ligament space. And the root tip pick is a delicate version and it's used to tease out small root tips. Now again, these are wedges and they're not meant to be used as wheel and axle rotation. They're not used they're not for use of rotational movement like you're doing with the crier. So we have the lever, wheel and axle, and the wedge. All right, and next we have the extraction forceps, and these are really the work, this is really the workhorse of the extraction sequence and the third step in luxating the tooth out of the socket. So forceps have a beak, a hinge, and a handle. So the 150 and 151 are universal forceps. They can be used for any of the teeth. The 150 is for the upper teeth, and the 151 is for the lower teeth. And it has to, the di main difference between these two is the curvature of the handle, so that the handle is always curving up when you're holding it in place, gripping the respective teeth. So 150 are for the upper teeth, and it's probably best equipped for uh, handling molars, but it does have an A variety, uh, which is a little bit more designed for premolars, also canines and incisors, and it comes in a serrated version. And the S form has smaller beaks, and that's meant for primary teeth. The 151 also has these, this A variety for premolars, and S variety for primary teeth. So again, the 150 for the uppers, 151 for the lowers. Now we have the lower cow horn forceps. These are a bit more specialized, and it's uh, number 23 forceps, and these are for lower molars. And it's called a cow horn because it has these two sharp beaks, just like these cow horns here, and they're meant to engage in the bifurcation of a mandibular molar. So you can get, if you can engage these beaks uh, enough apically, then you can engage that bifurcation and help luxate and remove that tooth. We also have a upper cow horn forceps, and these are a little bit less commonly used or less known, but they are just as useful as the previous slide. These are for the upper teeth, and they're right and left varieties. So the two beaks on this side and the two beaks on this side of the instrument are used to surround or hug the palatal root of a maxillary molar, whereas the one beak, which is on the other side here and this side here, is meant to engage in the buccal bifurcation. That's the bifurcation between the mesiobuccal and distobuccal roots. And so it has a very similar mechanic to the lower cow horn forceps, except this one is specialized for the upper maxillary molars. We also have the ash forceps. These are the number 74, and they're best used for mandibular premolars. Also have upper root forceps. This is number 65 and they're shaped like this in order to help facilitate removal and access of those upper roots. Now there are many, many more forceps out there. These are just the ones I've seen ever listed on a board exam question, so I wanted to include all of those. All right, so next we have blades. And so blades are used primarily in surgical extractions in order to um, create some soft tissue flaps. So you would load and remove the blade into the scalpel blade holder uh, with a hemostat, and you can hold the blade above this hole. It's probably the safest way to grab the blade with the hemostat, and we'll talk about the hemostat in just a few slides. And when using these blades, you want to hold the blade handle with a pen grasp for maximal control. The number 15 blade seen here is the most common for intraoral surgery for creating uh, mucogingival flaps. Number 11 is seen here, it has this very sharp edge as used for stab incisions, say for incision and drainage. Number 10 here is for 
large skin incisions. It's a larger blade than the other ones. And number 12 here is great for mucogingival surgery. And this curve enhances the ease of access to the sulcus. So it's great in periodontics. All right, so another thing we like to do um, in both surgical extraction and after a simple extraction is irrigation. So here is a monojet syringe, and we can load this up with sterile saline in order to clean out the extraction site. So we use a steady stream of sterile saline or water during bone removal uh, for a surgical extraction. And it prevents heat generation from the spinning burr that can damage bone. It also increases the efficiency of the surgical bone of the surgical burr. And it's because it washes away the chips of bone and provides lubrication for the surgical burr. So like I mentioned before, you wanna irrigate during surgical removal of bone and at the completion of any extraction to flush the socket of any debris, any infectious uh, or inflamed tissue. You can also uh, give a patient uh, this to take home with them for gentle, warm saltwater rinses and flushing out of the healing socket at home. I think that can be a very useful tool to use at for home care. So next we have the curettes. These are spoon-shaped, they have spoon-shaped ends here for scraping away soft tissue at the base of a socket. So you always, always curette a socket once you remove the tooth to get rid of soft tissue. This is a really, really important step that must not be skipped. So especially if there's a radicular cyst or some granulation tissue at the base of a socket, things we've talked about in the oral pathology series, we want to curette those out and get nice solid bone. This promotes better clotting, better healing, and bony infill of the socket. All right, next we have some bone removers. Uh, they're, these are all very, very different instruments, but I categorize them together because they all remove bone. So first we have the Rongers pliers, and these remove bone in small bites. It has this double spring here so that you can um, manipulate it very easily. And it's used primarily to trim interradicular bone. So if you remove, say, a mandibular molar and you have a small amount of interceptal bone there, we can take small bites out with the rongers. Now some clinicians, including myself, are guilty of using these as extraction forceps. But it's, it's sometimes nice to have something that's a little bit smaller than uh, extraction forceps. But I want to stress that it's not designed for that purpose. Its purpose is to trim bone. Down here we have the osteotome, which is a bone chisel, and it has a flat end, or its flat end is tapped with a surgical mallet with the chisel end on the bone or tooth to be sectioned. So the mono so what the bevel is referring to here is an angled slope at the end. So a mono, mono bevel means that it has one slope at the end here, and that's used to remove a torus. A bi-bevel means it has two sloped edges at the end here, and that would be used to section a tooth. This is not a favorite of any patient because it's pre, it can be pretty aggressive, you know, banging on a chisel with a hammer. So I... I rarely, rarely use this instrument, but it does have its uses, particularly when removing a torus. Here we have a bone file, and this is for final smoothing before suturing. And so I always feel with a gloved finger to feel for any sharp edges of bone after an extraction. So if it feels sharp to your finger, it is too sharp for the patient it needs to be removed. So we want to smooth those out for optimal healing. You remove bone with a pull stroke, and it's based on how the, the I guess I can say blades or the uh, sharp edges of this instrument are angled. 
So if we do a push stroke, we're just going to burnish, burnish those sharp edges and not really smooth anything out. But if we pull with this instrument, we'll actually remove and effectively smooth that bone. So only a pull stroke will be effective. Lastly, we have the surgical hand piece, and it's they come in contra angle and, and uh, straight varieties. What I want to stress here is that an air-driven handpiece, like a restorative handpiece, must not be used for, for an extraction surgery. And that's because it'll drive air into the socket. And air can pass through the tissue space, spaces of the fascial planes and lead to air emphysema. That's a rare but potentially serious complication of tooth extraction. And it can be easily avoided by using a handpiece that's specifically designed for surgery. So you can use a straight fissure burr like a 701 to section teeth, and you can use round burrs to remove bone. So you can remove interradicular bone, you can remove buccal bone. You can also use the straight fissure burr for those purposes as well. All right, so here are the hemostats, and they are designed for hemostasis, or stopping blood, hence why they're called that. So you could clamp uh, blood vessels closed before suturing or cauterizing. But it's also useful for blunt dissection of soft tissue, such as in an IND, which stands for incision and drainage. So to incise an abscess, it's showing it here, we would insert the hemostats into the incision while closed, and then gently open the needle, open the end here to gently open the soft tissue while inside. So it comes with curved or straight beaks, and it has a serrated end to allow for grasping. Now the foil to that are the needle holders. They look very similar but they're different in some very important ways. So the needle holder has shorter stout beaks and the face of the beak is cross hatched. So the hemostat, the beak of the hemostat has these straight lines, whereas this has cross hatches. And that allows for a more positive grip or grasp of the suture needle, unlike the hemostat. So essentially, the hemostat, if you try to grasp a suture needle, it could rotate around and you could have trouble keeping it still. And so a needle holder is a better instrument because of its short stout beaks and because of the cross-hatched nature of the face of its beaks. So it's designed to hold the needle of the suture. So speaking of sutures, let's talk about them now. And I do want to say there's a ton of information on sutures, and we could have several videos just on this topic alone. But the information you need to know for the board exam can be boiled down to these few points. So the suture consists of both a needle and a thread. So the suture relates to both components, not just one or the other. The primary purpose is to immobilize a flap, and that's important. The suture should be placed from movable tissue to non-movable tissue. So what does that mean? So you drive the needle through the flap first, that's the movable tissue. Then you drive the needle through the bound tissue on the other side. That's the order, the preferred order of creating your, your suture knot. The simple interrupted suture is the easiest and most common technique. If you see a question asking about a specific knot or suture technique, the answer will nine times out of 10 be simple interrupted. There are lots of different materials of suture threads. There's gut, there's chromic gut, there's vicryl, proline, but I wanna talk about silk suture thread because it has this wicking property that has been asked on the board exam and it allows bacteria to invade. So what does that mean? The, the silk suture thread is multi-filament, 
which means it's made from several strands braided or twisted together. And saliva can travel through this thread via capillary action. And of course with saliva comes bacteria. So now beneath your flap you can get this bacteria, you can get plaque accumulation and inflammation, and that's not a good thing. So it should be removed after a few days. And here is a picture of a simple loop or simple interrupted suture. Here we have two varieties of forceps, and these are not uh, extraction forceps. These are a completely different category. So the Adson tissue forceps have a toothed and non-toothed variety. This is for um, gently holding soft tissue or potentially passing a suture needle through tissue. The toothed version is for tough tissue like periosteum, muscle, and ap aponeurosis. I think uh, toothed for tough, T for T, or tooth uh, is more aggressive. And the non-tooth varieties for fascia, mucosa, and for handling biopsy tissue. So it's nice and gentle. The utility forceps are not to be used for handling soft tissue. I know they can be, um, they are used for that rather, but they're not, they're not meant to be used for handling soft tissue. That's what the adsense tissue forceps are for. Utility forceps should be used for picking up items from the tray or preparing packing materials. So essentially manipulating instruments on your tray and grabbing things from your supply. And lastly, we have different varieties of scissors. The Dean scissors are used for cutting sutures. They're angled up for better access to the suture thread. And the Mayo scissors are used for cutting fascia and dissecting soft tissue. All right, so that's it for this video. I know it was a long one, but I didn't want to leave out any of the common instruments uh, used in simple and surgical extractions. So uh, I hope you found this video helpful, and thank you so much for watching. If you're interested in supporting my channel, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to Michael Raja and all of my patrons for their support. I'm getting close to my first goal of unlocking a uh, purchasing a better professional microphone, so I'm really excited about that, uh, and that would be a nice upgrade to the channel. You can unlock extras like access to video slides to take notes on and extra practice questions for the board exam. So go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you all in the next video.